Okay. Inshallah, we should be able to hear. Uh, can you guys hear me on YouTube? Can everybody hear me? I'm sorry for the delay, but I had to make the prayer. Welcome to the call in and ask Sister Layla live show. Subhana Allah, this is our, and let me, uh, in fact, uh, put this here so everybody knows. Ask Sister Layla live show. And our call in number, what is the call in number, guys? Eight, uh, 862. 370, I'm going by photographic memory, 2838, I hope I'm right. Let's see if that yes, that's right. Oh God, that photographic memory kicked in. Okay, that's, this is the, um. oh, let's put it, there it is. This is the Ask Sister Layla Live show. For those of you who want to call in, you're using a, a what app or a, using a landline, That's the number. <laughs> I hope I got the phones on. <laughs> yeah, that's the call-in number, guys. For those of you who have questions that you would like to ask about Islam, inshallah, uh, we will try to answer your questions today. And let me see who all is here. We got a room full of Zoomers, alhamdulillah. And for those of you who would like to join uh, the Zoom room, so you can ask your questions live. Let me put uh, the address. You simply go to www.sunafollowers.net and click on join live class. That's all you have to do. Just click, you know, that it's right there on the screen, www.sunafollowers.net. And when you get there, click on join live class. And that will, uh, if you don't have the, um, uh, if you don't have Zoom on your cell phone, it will automatically download the software for you. And then you just join. You don't need a password or anything like that. It'll just bring you right on in. And also just to let everybody know, we are streaming simultaneously. We're streaming simultaneously on many different platforms. We are streaming simultaneously on YouTube. So you can go to YouTube and type your question and we'll answer it inshallah. We're also streaming simultaneously on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Join any of those platforms. And if you want, just type your question and I should be able to see you and I can answer your questions. Also, Twitter. We're streaming on Twitter. Type your question. It'll all show up here, inshallah. And for those of you who are watching and listening on Rumble and Odyssey, unfortunately, I cannot see your typing. But feel free to join YouTube. Feel free to join Facebook. Feel free to join our Zoom room if you have a question that you need to be answered. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullah. So we have Sister Sakina with us. There she is. There's our sister Sakina. She's one of my regular students here uh, at Sunnah Followers. MashaAllah, uh, a lot of the questions gets answered by her. Okay. And that's our sister Sakina. Alhamdulillah. Wearing that Jamila Pasha best. Alhamdulillah. So she's here with us. And also, let's see who else we got with us tonight. Uh, we have Sister Margaret. Walaikum salam, Sister Margaret. How are you? It's good to see you here with us uh, today. And also my beautiful sister, Samira. Sister Samira, she's another one of my regular students here that's been getting these hadiths together. Alhamdulillah for our class on how to pray. She's been answering them correctly. Alhamdulillah. Also like to welcome the new sister here uh, uh, or the new brother here. Alhamdulillah is probably one of the kids. Walaikum salam, goofy. One of the kids, we have a lot of the kids. And I want you guys to remember here at Suna Followers, all of our programs are kid friendly. What does that mean? That means, you know, the children, it's a family affair. It's a family affair. Hit it, Tiba. It's a family affair. Put the family around the computer 
and they can come in and learn how to pray the way the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us how to pray. They can also learn various topics of Akita, such as uh, the signs of the last hour, uh, what the Islamic creed consists of, you know, and things like that. And we have hadith classes, beginners, Arabic classes. So, you know, we are a family oriented website. So the children are welcome here. And in fact, you'll find a lot of the kids answer most of the questions here. The parents are kind of slow. They don't pick up as quickly as the children do. And also we have another one of my regular students from China. This is Sister Sarah. She lives in Canada, but she's Chinese. My little Sarah, she is Chinese. She's always here to support us and be a part of us. We also have another one of my regular students been coming here for about 20 years, Sister Amina. Amina, she's from Philly. Philly's in the house, Philadelphia, okay? Also, we have Sister Pamela. She's one of my moderators. So for those of you who are sitting there on uh, YouTube, if there seems to be a problem of some sort, you know, we get them type of people in here sometimes that want to try to make a fitna. If you see some fitna going on there on YouTube, you know, let Sister Pamela know and she'll knock them on up out of there. Yeah, she's one of my regular students and one of my better students, too. Alhamdulillah, we got some good people here. Basically, the people here at Suna Followers are very, you know, sweet and good people. And also, we got the twins, Norto and her twin sister, Aisha. Who are these? These, these are my favorites, my children. What can I say? They're maturing, you know? Your progeny. Your progeny are the people that you teach. Your progeny are those people that will continue to spread your knowledge of Islam to others. And of course, they're from Somali. By the way, they're available. So any brothers out there, any Somalis with that curly hair, hit me up here so I can hit up my babies here. Get my babies uh, married. Make sure y'all got some degrees, though, because these are educated girls. Yeah, they got college degrees, and they know they're dean, and they ain't putting up with no fitting up. And there's another picture here of me and the twins, and there's my best friend, Latifa, holding it up. You know, what can I say? My girl loves to party all the time. Yeah, Latifa's been quiet here at the website lately, y'all. You know, she's busy partying. You know, it's a family affair, though. She parties with her grandkids. I wouldn't, not with mine. But she parties with her grandkids. She parties with her, her ex. Oh, oh, sorry. Her friends. Her ex-friends. <laughs> it's a family affair. That's what happens when you have children. Once you have children by a person, you're always bonded to them. That's something real that a lot of sisters have to understand. When you have a child by a man, I'm sorry. Not only are you stuck with that child for life, but you stuck with brother too. Any family gatherings, brother man will show up. Okay. Ramadan gatherings, brother man will be there. He'll bring his new wives and his new children too. He'll come on in, make himself at home. So sisters, think about that. You know, just because you done divorced the dude don't mean that he's out of your life for good. He will be there. I know, been there, done that. He'll be at every family gathering until he dies. I know. So <laughs> let's keep it real. That's why Latifa ain't been here. But subhanAllah, that's my best friend, Latifa. And also, who else we got here? Sister Godi is here. MashaAllah. Wa alaikum salam. A sister Godi is watching us on the big screen. For those of you who don't know, you can always put this, uh, our website live on your big screen TV. You can go open up your YouTube app. Go to the Suna Followers channel on YouTube. We are streaming live. You can watch us on TV. I don't know how I look on TV. I hope I look nice. I tried to, you know, straighten myself up. It's been, it's been a complicated evening. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said everything in this world is short-term, short-lived. 
You can be on the greatest spiritual high. But all it's going to do is last for a couple of minutes because you're going to come tumbling down the earth and you're going to break a leg. You'll probably break an arm too. So I've been broken off my spiritual high that I was on. So that's life. And then what happens to Tifa? You die. Then you die. So what can I say? But anyway, you know, there's Goldie. Goldie is here. Alhamdulillah, uh, keeping it real with us. Oh, we have a new one of our new students here, Sister Lana. Sister Lana, she's one of my babies here too. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam, Lana. Any questions that you have, just feel free to type them on the screen and we'll answer them. In fact, you guys can start typing now if you want to. All I'm doing is just getting started, you know, and, and you know, uh, I'll keep answering until y'all have no more. So, you know, mashallah. And who else we have here? Um, also, guys, yes, as Sister Nortel said, this website, alhamdulillah, uh, we try to keep it real here at Sunnah Followers. I try to make sure that the classes that are taught here, first of all, they are based on Quran and authentic hadith. We don't deal with garbage here. And also, I try to make the topics of interest uh, to everyone. Whatever I'm teaching, I'm teaching my Akita classes. Whatever I'm teaching, I try to uh, break it down and have you uh, see how it relates to your life. And also, alhamdulillah, thanks to Allah giving us knowledge and uh, the ability to make use of the internet, we're able to stream on so many platforms now. But none of this is cheap. None of this is free. You know, remember, as Muslims, we're people of dignity, we're people of humility, and we're people of balanced. You know, so nothing's cheap here. We're not shabby women. We're not shabby Muslims. You know, we try to be women and Muslims of dignity. So, you know, it takes money. It takes money to keep this website looking professional. It takes money to keep this website looking real. So, you know, we are always in need of support, guys. Uh, you know, and I beg of you guys, I hate to say that, but I'm gonna have to use the word big because I checked our account. We ain't got but $300 in our account. Uh, so we're always in need of money to help support this Dawah effort, guys. So uh, if you're able to, please uh, click on that uh, QR code, you know, that QR code right there on the screen, you know, or the one at the top, and that'll take you to our PayPal site. And inshallah, you can uh, send in, you know, donations to help support this Jawa effort. And not just that, you know, a lot of you like to do the, uh, the, the Zell me. Is that what they call it? That Zell thing? Okay, you can also Zell us here at Suna Followers too. And uh, uh, that's the, uh, the email address. And by the way, there it is. I tried to, yeah. Oh, is this up there? Hold on. I made this uh, overlay. And I tried to put that on the overlay. There it is. That address at the bottom, www.soonerfollowers.net. That's how you join our Zoom room. Go to that link, click on join live class. It'll bring you here. And you don't need a password or a code. And then that second, that email address, Layla at soonerfollowers.net. You can use that address, you know, to not just email us, but also to Zelle, if anybody would like to donate to support this Dawah effort, you can Zelle us the money, you know, and it goes straight into this website. And again, we are a 501C, we are a 501C3, uh, uh, however they call it, website. What does that mean? That means we are nonprofit. We are legit a legitimized nonprofit organization. So any donations you make, you can write them off at the end of the year. Remember that. And inshallah, get your money back. Okay, but please support us. So now that I've made the introductions, and like I said, there's a lot of sisters here uh, in our inside our Zoom room. Uh, any questions that you guys have, you know, you can go ahead and start typing them on the screen and we can get started. Because there's a couple of things I'm going to talk about in between the answering of the questions. But let's see if some questions are going to come up first you know, that will serve as a great introduction uh, to the what the things I want to talk about. Okay. Okay. Let's see. 
We have our first question from Sister Fatima in the Zoom room. She wants to know if a Muslim parent died and a child of theirs wants to be put in the same grave, is that permissible? If the Muslim parent died and the child wants to be in the same grave, what do you mean? The same the same the, the same grave, like the plot that they're in, the parent is in, and the child says if anything happens to her or him, they would like to be put in there with their mom. Oh my goodness. Okay, this is a question we are here, of course, we're gonna get a question like that, that I really, I could answer, but I want to save it for uh, the people of knowledge. Let me call Sheikh Morsi. And I didn't okay. want to call him so soon. Sorry. That's okay. But I don't, those questions I try to leave for uh, Sheikh Morsi, who's a real scholar of the ulama and ha have him answer because I don't want to end up misinforming someone. Let me see if I can get Sheikh Morsi on the phone for that one. And if not, we'll call him back, but let me see. I don't think it's better. I just wanted to know, I, the person wanted me to ask. Look, let me ask, I mean, I, mean, I could an answer, but I prefer him. Okay. These type of things he prefers to answer anyway. Hello, Salam alaikum. Wa well, alaikum salam, Sheikh Morsi. We just started the Sunnah Followers Live uh, uh, Q&A show, and we have one, the first question for you. Can you take the answer right now? Inshallah. Okay. What is the question? Hmm? Go ahead with your question again, Fatima. Yes. Um, a parent has died, and one of her children are, you know, really mourning or whatever, but she said if they, if they were to pass away, they would want to be in the same grave as their parent, as their mom. Okay, is it permissible, in other words, for a child, if a child dies, to put them in the same grave with their mother who is dead? On top of her or whatever, however. Yeah, is that permissible in Islam? Both, uh, both they are Muslims? Yes, both Muslim. Yeah, yeah they can do that, yeah. Okay. Child and okay. his mother is okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Sheikh Morsi. If we have another one, I'll call you sure. back if there's another. We just started, yes. so I'll and probably have more. Okay. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, Rahmatullah. Okay. okay. That's what you do, guys. Let me tell you something. You know, when it comes to answering questions about Islam, like I said, I would have given that answer too, because that is, you know. But certain things, even if you know the answer or you think you know the answer to, when something involves a fatwa like that, it's best to refer it to the true people of knowledge. That's how the companions work. If a person would come to um, Ibn Abbas and ask him a question like that, he would get angry. He would say, why are you asking me? He said, there's someone better than me. Why don't you go and ask um, um, uh, Ali? Why don't you go and ask Uthman? Why don't you go and ask Abu Bakr? Why don't you go and ask um, 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 Umar? Because they were all living. When, you, when it comes to a question like that, you know, that really entails putting your opinion in it, maybe, although that one is clear, you know, it's best to refer it to the scholars. That's what I do. And so that's why I say when it comes, if you guys see with me questions like that, I'm going to send them to Sheikh Morsi or I'll call Dr. Dramali or I'll call Sheikh Atley or I'll call somebody that's more knowledgeable than me. And that's a sign of humility. As Muslims, we never project to know it all. OK, certain things is best to send on. Now, this stuff about marriage, divorce, that little petty stuff, lawful, unlawful with the little daily lies, we can handle that. But things that may need more uh, depth, questions that may need more depth, you refer them to the people of knowledge and just say, I'm going to pass this one on or I don't know. That's the adapt that we should have and adapt as Daya. That's for the kids here. OK, mashallah, mashallah. Okay, let's see. I'm looking at this, um, the chat program. Oh. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, 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 let me see this first, though. 
Oh, you got 15 watching? SubhanAllah, guys. <laughs> Sister Goldie says she has a crowd of 15 people watching on the big screen at her place. MashaAllah, let them know if they got any questions. Just put them on that screen there. And if I can't answer it, I'll do just like I did and get in touch with Sheikh Morsi. He knows that this is the Q&A show. Even though he's unable to join us because he's so busy, uh, he can, he'll take my calls. And that's what I like. Take the calls, you know. Subhanallah. Okay, go ahead. Can a Muslim woman go to an all-woman gym? Yes. Now, this is a good question. Because nowadays, we find Muslim women and Muslim men working out at Bally's in co-ed. This is wrong. You know, we're not supposed to show, you know, ourselves, you know, the people who are not Muslims to us. But if it's an all woman's gym, yes, but even then you have to be careful. Remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah has cursed the man who looks at the private parts of another man. And Allah has cursed the woman who looks at the private parts or the order of another woman. We have to remember even as women, all of our body, Every part of our body is, is, a, is order, is nakedness, except for this, the face, the hands, and what you see naturally are thereof if I raise my arm or something, okay? So if you are going to the gym and it's an all-female gym, you still need to cover your body. You know, you don't want to go there in the hot pants and a little tank top. And have the women, because especially with the LGBTQ community out there everywhere, infiltrating the masjids even, you know, you want to cover it up. So if you want to put on a jogging suit, okay, a loose, you know, jogging suit and go work out at a female gym, then yes, you can do that. And make sure your hair is covered. You do not remove your hijab. Keep it on too. Okay, so yes, you know, you can do that. But as far as going to a co-ed gym, no. I don't care what other folks tell you. No, no. Allah says, do not go near evil. Allah says, do not put yourself in a situation that may invite to evil. Okay, so be careful of that. Good, good question. Yes. Sister Halima said, growing up, she used to be told when your shoe is upside down, it means that it's, it's disrespectful to Allah or cursing him. Is that true? Okay, oh, unfortunately, guys, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it's part of the human nature to be pessimistic. What is pessimistic? That's superstitious. As human beings, we are superstitious by nature. And your personal gen will play on that and push you to become even more pessimistic. Because if a person, you know, uh, indulges in pessimism, what does that mean? That means that this is a person that doesn't truly believe in the cotter of Allah or the decree of Allah. So unfortunately, when Islam spread from out of Arabia into the other, the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, then under the Caliphate of Uthman, it spread across, across the ocean into Africa a lot of these countries converted to Islam, but they brought in to this religion a lot of pessimistic, superstitious beliefs. Remember our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said Islam is based on two sources and two sources of long, alone. And those sources are the book of Allah, which is the Quran, and my sunnah, which are the hadiths. So if a person tells you that if you turn a shoe over, this means a, a, this or this is a sign of that, then they should be able to bring the clear cut hadith, the authentic, that's the key too, authentic, clear cut hadith that says if you turn this shoe up, it means this. Otherwise, this is pessimism. Otherwise, this is superstition. And as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in another authentic hadith, a, a pessimism, superstition is a, a form of disbelief. So we disregard garbage like that. 
things that you heard as a child that have not been proven with evidence from the Quran and Hadith, you leave it alone. It's just garbage and keep it moving. Okay. What should a Muslim woman wear to go swimming in a public pool? Okay, we get these questions all the time because summertime is upon us. Okay, first of all, there uh, in regards to the pool, there's a lot of things that have to be met. Number one, a Muslim woman should never wear, should never be in a public pool, period. If it's a public pool, that means other people are in there, male and female. You're not supposed to be in there at all, period. And not just Muslim women, Muslim men too, because I get sick and tired of this lopsided attitude that a lot of Daya have. Well, they say, oh, this means this. So a man don't have to have a beard. A man don't have to, he can go to Bally's. But you women, y'all still got to be oppressed. Uh-uh, that ain't it's fine. The laws and the rules of uh, a dab in regards to uh, the private parts and all and intermingling apply to women and men. No Muslim male or female should be in a public pool that that includes the opposite sex. So if a woman and her husband and children want to go swimming, they don't swim in the pool that's occupied, you know, by a mixed crowd. The husband will take his wife and his children to a secluded place, a lake or a creek or something where there's no other people but them. And then they can make use of the pool. And being that it's public, again, the aura for the woman is her whole body except for this. So even though you getting in a public pool, a pool is outside, which means public, public. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, any woman who removes her clothing somewhere other than the home of her husband has removed the barrier between her and Allah. There's your Dalil. Hadith is authentic. Okay? So you're going to remain covered except for this. Even out in, by, along with your husband and children, if it's a public pool. So you're going to have on an abaya, and it's going to be kind of rough. I'm going to tell y'all, it's rough. I done been there, done that. Because when that abaya gets wet, very not much weight this thing is going to be. I went into a pool one time. Oh, it wasn't a pool. It was a lake, a waterfall, as a matter of fact. I was in a waterfall. Man, never again. And, and it took forever for that abaya to dry. So you can imagine how I was cold. I ended up catching pneumonia, asthma in the hospital. You know the rest. Okay. But yes, we have to cover our bodies outside the home. You have to dress the way Allah commands us to dress. He says, oh, you women who believe, draw your veils over your bosom. Oh, you women who believe, whenever you leave your home, we have to be addressed in clothing that is not see-through and does not show the shape of our body. An abaya, an overgarment. That's what abaya means. That's what jilbab means. Something that's going to cover over me. Not to cover over my colors, not to cover over that, my jewelry, to cover over the curves of my body. Only one that should see, be able to see my curves are my mahrams. And I wouldn't show my curves to no mahram unless it's my husband. I don't even want, you don't even walk around your brothers like that. Not a woman of dignity. Okay. So, you know, if you're going to go swimming, you know, you should not swim in a public pool at all. If you are a Muslim woman or a man, if it's co-ed, you can't do it at all. Now, if, this is, if it's a gym, if you're going to an all women's gym, you can do that. You can get in the public pool then. But still, you have to cover your body. You cannot remove your clothing. You're letting down the barrier between you and Allah. 
But I tell you what you can do. You can put on one of those, uh, they call them Islamic swimsuits. They're not Islamic because they tight. They're made out of spandex. They show your shape, but they're tight. You cannot wear that around men, but you could wear that in a pool that's nothing but women in it because it comes with the hijab cap that, and it covers your neck. It covers your skin. You can't see no skin at all except this. Okay. So you can wear one of those swimsuits in a public pool for women only, but that's the only place you could wear that. Okay. If it was men involved, you got to find a place secluded away from them and still put on that abaya and stuff. Okay. All right. Any other questions on that? You sisters understand that about the pool and that goes for you brothers too, because remember last weekend we talked about how one of the sisters here said her husband, they live in an apartment complex and her husband goes swimming every day in the public pool with the naked calf or women. But he told her that she can't go swimming. I mean, come on. Allah is not oppressive. Allah doesn't make rules of oppression against one and not the other. That's crazy. I told you, your husband ain't got no business swimming in that public pool. Tell him to get his behind out of that pool or you're going to be uh, uh, tossing him to the curve. Righteous women are for righteous men. Irrighteous women are for irrighteous men. And that's irrighteousness. Yes. Okay. Next question. In regards to that question about the pool, you know, you know nowadays they have where um, they have, um, you know, how you can teach your child to like swim, like children under age. Is it okay if you as a person also, if they have like all women and children, can you still as a Muslim woman, you know, swim in there? It's all women and children, you say? Yes, like at the YMCA, they have where yes, they teach children to swim because nowadays, you know, Muslim yes. children are drowning in the pool. Yeah, you can stuff, do so. that. But still, if it's all women, wear one of those suits. Wear one of those uh, suits that I was talking about because you still don't put on no bikini around women because a woman cannot look at the aura of another woman. So, yes, you can do that with the children, but wear one of those suits I'm talking about. Okay, so the next question is Brother Malik. He said, Miss Layla, some imams, after they make dua, they wipe over their face. I was trying to make sure is there, I was trying to make sure it's right. Is that okay for us to do so? Okay, we've been talking about how to perform the prayer from A to Z. And we went over all the sunnahs of the prayer, and we went over all the pillars of the prayer. There are no pillars or sunnahs of the prayer that entail wiping over the face. This is innovation. This is innovation. This is not from the Sunnah. This is not from Islam. Okay? So, no, we don't do that. We don't wipe over the face and body when we make dua. You know, only time that that's been done is when you're doing rukia over yourself. And if you're a strong believer, you don't even do rukia. I don't. I've never done rukia. I don't have, I mean, my faith is strong enough. Okay? But that's the only time you would blow in your hands and wipe over your body part. But as for making regular supplication, no, this is a bidda. This is an innovation. And we don't indulge in that behavior. Okay, the next question is, um, this brother wants to know, if we cannot make it to the mosque on Friday for the Juma prayer, can we pray those two rakats at home? If you don't go to the mosque for the Juma prayer, it's not two rakats. That's dur. Dur does not consist of two rakats. Dur is four rakats. It's only two rakats if you pray it at the mosque behind the imam. So no, you don't make two rakats. You make four. That's the dur prayer. A lot of brothers don't understand salat al dur on Friday. That's the dur prayer. The Juma prayer is the salat al dur prayer. Except that since you are praying it with the imam and Friday is our day, Allah made, the, made that prayer consist of just two rakats. But only if you pray it at the mosque behind the imam. 
Do you brothers understand that? So if you're not at the, if you don't go to Juma prayer, your doer prayer is four rakats, not two. Okay. The next question is a sister wants to know what can we wear around Muslim Muslim woman? What is our aura around the Muslim woman? Again, the aura around the Muslim woman. Let me talk to you about the prophet's wives for a minute. And this is what I say. I don't hear that many dia. I don't hear any of them. I'm going to be honest. I don't hear any of them. Not the women. Uh, speak about the prophet's wives and how they dressed. Even though Islam allows women to be less rigid around each other. Do you guys know the prophet's wives, Aisha never took off her hijab when she was around other women. Um Salama never did that. Zainab never did that. I've never done that. I've been best friends with Latifa since I was 12 years old. I don't think Latifa, she might have seen my hair one time. And that was probably by accident. And I don't remember ever seeing her hair. Supana Allah. Okay, because again, part of being a believer is that we are people of dignity, humility, and balance. Dignity is called modesty. I think I would feel funny if I took off my hijab and Latifa came over to visit me. I think I'd feel funny because this is not me. This is a part of me that you should never know of. That's how I look at it. Because I had someone ask me that, a relative uh, grandma, one of my grandkids. Grandma, why you never take off your hijab when you around us? This is one of my granddaughters. She said, oh, she's never seen my hair. I said, that's not the part of me that you should know. I said, the part of me that you should know is what you see sitting here now. And you should try to be it. Be this. That most inner part of you, that most inner part of you should only be shared with the person that's entitled to that, meaning your husband. Now, that doesn't mean that I have to cover up in uh, all, you know, I, you know, a woman... A woman, all of her body is order except for this, what y'all see here, okay? Does she, yes, she could take her hijab off. There's nothing that says a woman has to cover her hair around another Muslim woman. You know, yes, I could wear a pair of jeans and a top. I don't have to put an abaya on around another woman. I could put on a pair of jeans, they can be tight fitting and a top. But is that something that you would feel comfortable in? I wouldn't. I wouldn't feel comfortable with Latifah visiting me and I got on a pair of skinny jeans and I got on a tank top. I'd have to throw an, a, a, an abaya on. Okay, so, but technically, you know, the woman's private parts are considered the navel to the knee as the man. And that's the hadith too. You know, the woman's private parts, the scholars agree that the woman's private parts around another woman is the same as the, the, the order of, of a man, which is the navel to the knee. But my question is, would you feel comfortable like that? We're supposed to have haya. Haya is a component of faith. Modesty. There's different components of modesty. Would you feel comfortable a, 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 let a woman watching you breastfeed your baby? I wouldn't feel comfortable having my breast out and having this sister sit next to me. And I know there are some cultures that do that, and that's their culture, but it ain't mine. I wouldn't feel comfortable. My culture is Islam, and I wouldn't feel comfortable watching another woman nurse her baby. And I'm looking at her breasts. I'm looking at her legs, her thighs, her waist, you know, so, but technically to answer your question, the woman's order around another woman is the same as the man's from the navel to the knee. But again, it's a question of higher modesty. 
Would you feel comfortable doing that? Would you want people to see you that way? Ain't nobody supposed to see me like that. No, not even my grandkids. Yeah. Okay. The Another question a brother wants to ask is, if a person gets good news and he does sujood for thankfulness, and he also follows a follows that up with praying two rakats for thankfulness, that person offering for a week, can he stop or that person or does that per if that person fears if that takes away his glad tidings? Wait a minute, what happened? What about it? He he said he'd do it for a week. What about the week? He just said if a person gets good news and he does sujood for thankfulness. And he also prays two rakats for thankfulness. That person offering for one week, can he stop or that person okay, fears? Okay, you don't have to do it for a blood? week, guys. There's no, you can do it that one time. You know, you didn't, the prophet didn't sit around making, prostrating for any certain, no, it's the one time. Whenever the the the, you, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us, whenever you receive good news about something, Thank Allah for it immediately. Prostrate, say, oh Allah, thank you for this great thing that happened to me. And then follow it up by doing a good deed. And that's it. And Allah, and think about all the other good things he did for you. And Allah will keep the blessings coming. That's it. You don't have to keep doing that over and over again for a day, a week, a year. No, just at one time. The prostration of thankfulness uh, is just one time. You know, I got good news. I had good news yesterday. Thanks to Fresno, it's gone. We're going to talk about that with Mr. Cat. The kids are going to hear about it from that cat that's been sitting out there on that trash can watching everything on Sunday. But yesterday when I got some good news, the first thing I did, I said, oh, Allah, I can't prostrate because of my knees. But I raised my hands. I said, oh, Allah, thank you, Allah, thank you, Allah, thank you, Allah, for this blah, 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 blah. And then I went and made two rakats. And then I came in here and answered some questions about Islam. Those are my two good deeds. And that's it. That's it. I don't have to keep doing that over and over again. It's when we fail to thank Allah at all. That's when Allah will take away the goodness and, and he'll stop sending good news to you. Okay. Let me ask this question here from Sister Lana that's been sitting here. She said, if my female friend is Muslim, but she does major sins often, could I remain her friend or leave her alone? Leave her alone. Because the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, be careful. Be careful who you choose to be your friends. Because a person takes on the characteristic of their friends. He said, a person adapts the religion of their friend, their behavior, their characteristics. So choose your friends wisely. So if there's a Muslim who is a Muslim, but she's not a good Muslim, stay away from her. Find better friends. You want to choose friends that are good, that'll help you to become the best you can become as a Muslim. You don't choose people that are crooked and bad and evil because you'll end up becoming like them. Okay? So no, do not be friends with a Muslim that isn't that that is committing sins no especially for you young kids don't do that another question a sister wants to know is what cosmetic surgeries are muslims allowed to get any cosmetic surgery on earth that doesn't transgress the limits of Allah. And, and this is something that I'm teaching in my series. By the way, guys, don't forget tomorrow we have the lawful and the unlawful. That's tomorrow night at 9 p.m. We're going to be continuing. We're going to talk about that. We're going to answer the question, what is considered going to the extremes in beautification? We're going to talk about cosmetic surgery. Cosmetic surgery is not haram, it's a treatment. 
As the prophet Muhammad said, most things in life, when it comes to our everyday life, are lawful. The companions had cosmetic surgery. During the battle of Badr, one of the companions lost his nose. It got chopped off. They rushed him to the hospital that was attached to the masjid. And the physician and his daughter sold him a nose. They made a nose out of gold. They took some gold, molded it into a nose, and did surgery and replaced his nose with it. So who told you that cosmetic surgery is haram? Cosmetic surgery is not haram. It's just like the COVID vaccine. These are treatments that come from Allah. Allah tells us in the Quran that he's the one that sends sickness. And for every sickness, there is a cure. He's the one that sends sickness and he's also sends treatment. He said, I never send the sickness without sending its treatment. So what is the treatment for a, a broken nose or a nose that's missing? The treatment is make him or give him, let him have cosmetic surgery, give him a new nose. What's the treatment for my skin being burnt? I was in a fire or the, the dish or something fell on me and my face is burnt. The treatment is let him have cosmetic surgery. What is the treatment for obesity? The, the, what the treatment for obesity is a bariatric surgery. So, you know, th this is, comes from a law. Technology comes from a law. He's the one that gives that knowledge to the people of that who are deserving of it. The doctors, those are scientists like Dr. Asim who come up with the treatment for the COVID, the treatment for this. You know, a law gives them that knowledge. Okay, back in the prophet's days, we didn't have that type of knowledge, not th on this level. But then again, the sicknesses then were not on this level. Back in the prophet's time, the eighth century, what was the treatment? What was the treatment for most illnesses? Number one, the black seed for the sicknesses they had. Number two, the urine of camel, camel urine. Number three, cupping. They cupped. They didn't have penicillin back then. They cupped. You know, but that was the eighth century. Allah has progressed us up past that. He's get like he says in the Quran, he's the one that reveals the knowledge to the people deserving of it over time. So now I don't have to treat myself with black seed if I get the flu. If I get a virus, I go take the flu. I got to take the flu shot. Allah gave us uh, 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 the, 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 the flu shot as a treatment. Back in the prophet's days, they used to get leprosy. They used to contract polio. Allah not only gave the treatment, but the cure for that, for a lot of that stuff. We don't have to drink urine from a camel. We don't have to depend on honey and black seed and cupping. I ain't got to go get cupped. I can take some penicillin. Man, give me some of them antibiotics. That'll get the bad blood out of me. So y'all have to understand, Allah is in control. This all comes from him. And that's why Allah says, take whatever treatment I give. Whatever treatment that I come, I give. Cosmetic surgery is a treatment. Whatever it is that you need it for. Okay, so who told you it's haram? We have to be careful saying things are haram without clear evidence. Okay, okay, next question. We have a lot of questions here, but okay. Uh -huh. A um, Muslim man wants to know, this brother wants to know, can Muslim men pray with a tank top on? We talked about that. No, because a man's order is from the navel to the knee. A tank top does not cover your navel to the knee. It's just covering your chest like a little girl. Why would you want to wear a tank top? A tank top is something for women. Are you uh, LGBTQ? What's up? You one of them LGBTQ Muslims that I got in here? Let me talk about that for a minute. Hit it. 
Hello, let me talk to y'all about this LGBTQ. We got a lot of uh, Muslims who are LGBTQ. We got some that are transgender. And one of the questions that one of the Muslims sent me in the email that I read today was, I'm a transgender. I am a woman. I define myself as a woman. But I was born a man. So when I go to the mosque, what should I do? First of all, you better let them know that you a man because you ain't nobody's woman. Whatever Allah made you be is what you are. And if you're going to go into any Islamic community, you better let the imam and the people in that community know, even though I look like a woman, this was done before I was a Muslim. I am really a man because you cannot be around us believing women. We cannot be in the company uh, and get loose with men who are not mockums to us. You're violating all types of sacred laws in Islam. So you have to let the people know that you are really a man. You do not go to the women's restroom. You go to the man's restroom because you're a man. You're not a woman. And you're going to, that's part of repentance. We talked about how in order to repent from your sins, you got to stop the sin. You got to feel bad about the sin. You have to be determined to never fall into that sin again. And if the sin entailed an injustice to yourself or, or others, you have to make the restitution. Part of the restitution is I'm a man. I ain't no woman and I'm going to own it and start living your life as a man. Does everybody understand that? It's a shame that these type of days are upon us, but they are. Okay? So the brother what they want to wear a tank shop top, what the heck your mama and your daddy letting you wear tank tops for? You better take that girly stuff off and be a man. Put some, some a shirt on because your shoulders should be covered when you pray. Even though the shoulders are not part of the man's aura or his stomach, we talk his, his um chest. We talked about that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we went over that hadith, told the companions, pray with a shirt on. He saw one companion praying and he didn't have a shirt on. And the Prophet knew that this companion wasn't poor. He said, Don't you have a shirt? Yes, at home. Go put it on and pray in it. Now, if a man doesn't have any other clothing, all he got is his loincloth, then it's okay. But if you got a, a clothing at home, cover your, your shoulders. And your navel to the knee is your nakedness. So you cannot pray in a tank top if you a man. Because that means your navel is not covered. It's exposed. This is haram. Throw that girly stuff away. Yeah. Um, a brother wants to know, does the hadith about the rewards of the Sunnah prayer apply to the Juma prayer? Example, can we pray the Sunnah prayers for Duhur when it's time for the Friday prayer? What do you mean? Okay, we talked, that's the, what the whole thing we're talking about. The Sunnah prayer should be prayed at home. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would pray his Sunnah Rakats of Dur at home. And then he would go to the mosque and do the, the Juma prayer. So you should pray those two or four Rakats at home and then go to the mosque and do uh, um, the uh, pray behind the Imam. And then when you come home, pray the other uh, uh, Sunnahs of Dur. If you are not going to the mosque, and you want to pray your sunnahs at home, then you just pray them before dhuwr. You pray either four or two rakats before, and then you pray uh, four or two rakats after. You got it? That's Brother Murad asking this question about prayer. He Brother also Murad, wants to know, do not make yourself make crazy over that. Yeah, um, 
He's, he also wants to know, can we make wudu? And um, if we want to wipe over our socks, do we wipe one time or can we wipe it three times? Brother uh, Marar, this is, here you are. You got the balance, dude. This is the problem that Muslims have. As your, as your knowledge of Islam increases, your balance begins to waver. <clears throat> You're learning a lot from me now, Brother Marard. You're learning the Sunnah. You're learning how to pray the way the Prophet taught us straight from the authentic Hadith. Your personal jinn is now pushing you to be a fanatic. He's pushing you to make up things. He's pushing you to add things that they don't that were never mentioned. We already talked about the wiping. How many times did the Prophet Muhammad wipe over his socks and shoes, Brother Marard? How many times did he do it? He only did it once. Why are you going to add to it? That's innovation. See how your personal gen is pushing you to be an innovator. Wiping over the shoes, wiping over the socks, wiping over the hijab, wiping over the turban is a concession from a law. And being a concession, it is a concession of worship. And what does that mean, Marard? That means all actions of worship must be performed the way the prophet said to do it. The prophet said you only wipe once. He did not say that the one, two, or three applies to wiping over socks, shoes, or turban. That only applies to making voodoo, the regular voodoo. So if you're going to wipe over your shoe, wipe over your sock, it's only one time. That's it. If you feel dirty, then that's your problem. Everybody understand that? Don't allow your gin to make to push you to become fanatical, Brother Marard, because once that happens, you lose everything. Yes, including the knowledge. In regards to that, he also wants to know if two people are praying together, do they have the option to stand side by side? How many or times have one you... behind another? Or are they all begated to two people? How many times have you asked me that question, Brother Marar? You ask that every other day. I think it's been answered a thousand times. Sheikh Adley answered that for you several times, and I answer it for you almost every other day. Like Sheikh Adley told you, if it's two men, again, prayers should be done the way the Prophet Muhammad did. And like the prop, like Sheikh Atli told you, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed with a Nas or a Buhurera or any other person, they would stand side by side. You asked Sheikh Atli, could you also stand to the front if you wanted to? And like the prop, like Sheikh Atli told you, do you think you better than the Prophet? Remember when he asked you that? He said, why would you want to do something other than what the prophet did? You think you better than him? Why don't you just stick to what the prophet did and don't ask stuff like that? And that's the same answer that I'm repeating back to you today. You have to combat your fanaticism, Marard. Pour yourself in. Pour your reins in. Because your gin is trying to push you out. Which is normal. Because your faith is, you're way up there. Your iman is way up right now. You're very high in your belief right now. So this happens to us when we reach that level. Yeah. So just pray. If it's two, uh, you and another man, pray side by side. Do it like the prophet did. Don't try to outdo him. Yeah. So in regards to that question about the um, co-ed pools, can a Muslim um, woman go to like water slides or is that still a no? The same rules apply, so women. I know this is summertime, but y'all better stay y'all behinds in the house. I mean, see, y'all getting tempted like this. You better go buy a, 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 one of those back door, uh, those backyard pool, baby pools and sit your butt in it or go take a shower. The same thing, anything public, that's public. That's public. You can't do no water slide. 
How are you going to be a Muslim? Can you see, you think you the flying nun? You're going to be coming down. You ain't Jesus. What you think? You holding on to the wings of angels and your hijab flying and it gets caught up. You better keep your behind at home. Okay. These sisters, hey, sister. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, a sister wants to know, are all innovations haram? Of course. Innovation means to introduce something into the way we worship a law that was not introduced by the prophet. So innovation, it, it applies to worshiping a law. It doesn't apply to technology. It doesn't apply to a car, a house, but worship. Anything that relates to how we worship a law, we do not do it. It's haram unless a law said otherwise. Innovation is in regards to the way we worship, not technology, worship. And there's no such thing as good innovations. All innovations are bad because they destroy the Sunna. They say that the that you are also an innovator is saying that Allah made mistakes, that Allah forgot to tell us something, that the Prophet Muhammad is a liar, that he didn't complete his mission. So there is no good innovation. It's haram. All of it. It will be rejected. There will be people to reject it. People like me, people like Sheikh Ali, people like Abu Usama at the Habi, you know, we will reject it. Okay. A brother, okay. A brother wants to know um, how did the Prophet give dawah to the Jews or Christians? He says that nowadays he sees, you know, the Muslim brothers using Bibles and refu refuting them back and forth. Also, in regards to that same question, he wants to know, did the prophet or his companions ever debate with non-Muslims no. while giving da'wah? None of this is the, from the Sunnah. The prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam couldn't even read. Okay, he never read a Bible. He never read a Torah. The companions didn't do that either. In fact, they never debated because Islam forbids that. Okay, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the people whom Allah hate the most and will have dr dragged by their faces and thrown into the hellfire on the day of judgment are the debaters. Those people are used to, the, to debate the religion with others. You know, how did the prophet give dawah? As the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in an authentic hadith, true dawah is not the words you say. True dawah is from your actions. He said, I was sent to teach you Islam. And the way to teach you Islam is by teaching you good manners, good character, good morality. That's how he gave dawah to the non-believers. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions migrated to Medina, that's where the Jews were. The Jews were impressed with his diplomacy. They were impressed with his honesty. They were impressed with his fear of Allah, his love for Allah, his love for his fellow man. This is why many of them converted to Islam. The prophet, you're not gonna find not one hadith where the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sat down and debate it with a Jew or a Christian, their book versus ours. Like I said, he couldn't even read. He didn't do that. You're not gonna find nothing like that. What you will find is like the story I gave y'all the other day, the story of Yusuf. To test the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to see if he was a true prophet, the Jews would come to him and ask him questions about the men that they heard about in their book. They would say, tell me about Yusuf. Tell me about Solomon. Tell me about Jesus. Tell me about Mary. And when they would come and ask him, he would remain quiet sometimes. 
Sometimes he would start sweating. Sometimes he'd stare out into the sky and just sweat. That's when Allah was sending the revelation to him. And then he'd start speaking, say, O Muhammad, in the name of your Lord, Allah would send to him the words to tell them about Jesus, tell them about Solomon, tell them about Yusuf, alayhi salam. That's how the prophet answered their questions. Did he sit on the street corners like these ignorant men today who call themselves Muslims are doing, you know, are stopping people as they walk by with their children? Hey, come here. You're a Christian. Hey, let's talk about it. No, he didn't do nothing ignorant like that. Remember, we are people of dignity. We are people of humility and balance. Only indignified people do that. Only uncultured people behave like that. Only imbalanced people behave like that. The prophet was an example to us of true dignity, true balance, true humility. So no, his dawah was through his action. How did Islam spread throughout the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire? and the Egyptians, the Indians, and all the others. It was our behavior. The rest of the world, when they came upon the Muslims, they would look, they were shocked to see the Tarbiya, the brotherhood that existed between us. Why was it that so many women converted? The women around the world, the Romans, the Persian women, they were impressed with how we Muslim women were better. We had rights that no other women on earth had. We had the right to believe in Allah, the right to worship him, just like the men do, the right to fight for him, just like the men do. We were women of dignity, humility, and balance, unlike the Roman women were, unlike the Persian women were, unlike the Indian women were, unlike the Egyptians and the others. So our behavior, that's how Islam spread. It didn't spread through the sword. It didn't spread through Bible bashing. It didn't spread through debate. There's no compulsion in Islam. The companions would tell the non-Muslims as they went from land to land, live with us in peace. There's no compulsion. We're not here to force our belief system on you. And many of the people converted because they were impressed with that behavior, that integrity, such valor. SubhanAllah, they look at men like Khalid bin Wali. SubhanAllah, they look at Ibn Abbas. They look at these companions, Umar, such valor. You only hear about it in books, such valor that doesn't exist today. The women would look at the, the female Sahaba, the female companions, Asiya, okay? They would look at Um Hakam, Atika, Um Atia, Kala, the sister of the black dark warrior. These were women of integrity, dignity, and respect. They didn't take no crap off of anyone. They never compromised their deen, their belief for anyone. And they did not stand 10 feet behind no man. Kala, the sister of the dark night. She stood right there beside Khalid bin Wali. She looked him in the eye. Khalid bin Wali said, are you a male? Because he thought she was a man because she was covered and shooting those arrows at him and his men. He said, un un remove your, your helmet, your face veil, man. She took it off. Khalid bin Wali was shocked. He said, you're a woman. She said, I am Kala. I only fear Allah. I am the sister of the dark night. She said, the Kafir have taken my brother hostage. I am trained in sword and bow, just as he is. She said, I am on my way to confront Peter the Great. 
and win back my brother. Khalid bin Wali said, ride up. We're riding with her. And she led the, them out to get her brother back who was taken hostage by Peter the Great. That's the stuff that caused Islam to spread throughout the world. The rights that Allah gave us women, the dignity, the humility and balance of us women. We were side by side with the men, not in the back licking pus. Weren't, the men weren't hitting us with mishwack like these ridiculous men today tell you. We were right there with them on the battlefield with the sick and like Carla leading the way to free those of us that were taken. That's how Islam spread, guys. Character, behavior, valor that we don't see no more today. It's sad. Next question. Exactly. Um, a sister wants to know, can I study Greek mythology? Because I know some people actually consider Greek mythology as a religion. Okay, I studied Greek mythology because it was I have a degree in ancient civilization because I've had a I'm a writer. I like to write when I was a child, I used to love to write fiction stories about the based on I still do it, paranormal, vampires, werewolves. Horses that fly, fairies, and that type of stuff, you know. So I took a few classes and studied it so I can come up with some more myth, myth, mythical creatures to write about. You know, I didn't believe in that stuff because I was a dyer even then. I was giving classes back then, too, when I was in college teaching, okay? But I did it to get to more ideas as to how to be a writer. I like to write fantastical stories. I'm a fantastical person, okay? So, but what are you taking it for? Are you doing it like I did? I just took it, those classes and I got, I got a degree in ancient civilizations. I only took a few of those classes just to get some ideas on, I used to be the, I was the uh, editor of my college newspaper and I had to do some fiction writing. That's why I took those classes. But what are you taking it for? You know, are you taking it like I was doing just to get an idea how to write for this paper, this newspaper? Because I was a fiction editor. Going to school to get a degree in it is nonsensical because there's no, no money in that field. I have a degree in ancient civilization, but y'all can guess what civilization I focused on. The Islamic civilization. That's why I got that degree. Okay, the Islamic civilization, the Egyptian civilization. I did Greek too, because that comes with it. Roman too, that comes with it. Persian, that comes with it. But I took it so I can know the history of Islam. That's why I can give y'all the history on a lot of these hadiths. My history of Islam and how it spread through the world helps make stuff make sense to me too. Like Hakim Quick, he's the best at that. Okay, so what are you taking it for? It depends on what are you taking it for because ain't no jobs in that and ain't no money in that. Go to school to be a nurse. Okay. The same sister wants to know, um, can I have my hair done at a professional all-woman salon? There is nothing in Islam that says you cannot have your hair done. The prophet's wives used to get their hair done. Why do y'all think the, that the prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah curses the woman who goes to get her hair done and they put fake hair in. That hadith there should tell y'all they were going to the salon even back then. Hair salons always existed. The Egyptians used to make wigs and do hair. The Arab women always did hair, braids and stuff. So there is nothing in Islam that forbids women from going to a female salon and having a woman do your hair. Just make sure she ain't put no string in it, no um, yarn in it, no fake hair in it to lengthen it. 
common sense. When y'all hear people tell y'all that things are haram and you're going to hell because you a woman, well, why did the prophet say that any woman that goes and gets her hair done? They were doing it back then, yes. None of this stuff is new. Yes, you can go get your hair done. In fact, I get mine done every two weeks. I need to make an appointment for next week. Remind me for Tima to make an appointment to get my hair done next week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A brother wants to a brother wants to know um there were the rewards a person gets for the 12 sunnah prayers surrounding the five daily prayers and also the reward for the four sunnah prayers at Duhar. If a person prays both, do they get do they get both rewards? Okay, this is a again, guys, y'all stop that fanaticism because you brothers are gonna burn yourself out and defeat. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to address Amir El As about that. Amir El As and a few other brothers, three, it was three of them. They were like you guys. They became Muslim and they began to learn the religion. They loved the law and they wanted to do the best they can do. They wanted to be go over and board. And the Prophet had to tell him, Shway, wait a minute, calm down. Hold it. You're going to burn yourself out. Okay? Don't worry about the reward. If you want to do all those prayers, do them. And you do them for the sake of Allah and keep it moving. Don't sit there trying to see if you can count how many deeds you're getting. Because only Allah knows that stuff anyway. You don't even know if Allah is accepting your sunnah prayers. Remember, the sunnah prayers you ain't even going to be asked about on the day of judgment. So we got to stop overthinking it. A lot of you Muslims, when you learn the religion correctly and you, your faith grows, y'all overthink it. And then you get defeated real quick. You're going to be burnt out in three months. In three months, you're going to be burnt out and you're going to be like that other companion who stopped praying the night prayer completely because he was so fanatical, so extreme that he burnt himself out. He lost the love for it, the desire for it. Just do the sunnah prayers to the best of your ability. Remember, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah, he loves for us to do good deeds according to our capability. So don't think about and try to figure out how many rewards you get because nobody can answer that. Only Allah knows if he's going to reward you or not. He may decide you so extreme you busy trying to count your rewards that your kushua, your concentration ain't right. So you can walk away with no reward at all for all them prayers you making. Your intentions could be wrong. You're doing them for the wrong reason. So don't think of the good deeds like that. We don't go around trying to count them up and figure out if I'm going to get the same. Just do them according to your capability and take it easy on yourself. You know, take it easy. Yeah. Don't think yeah. about the reward. Just do it. Because nobody can answer that for you anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have to speed up on these questions because it's almost 11 and you still have like 10 more. That's okay. Yes, you, can, I'll, you can get them. I know I started late today, remember? Okay, okay. Yeah. So um, this sister wants to know if she can get a belly button piercing. Okay. Islam forbids us. And by the way, I want everybody to pay attention. Y'all see how I'm answering these questions? Do y'all see how I'm answering with hadith? I'm giving y'all evidence, hadith to support everything I say. And don't come back and ask me for a number because we don't, the hadiths are not numbered. Okay. But y'all see how I'm answering these hadiths? This is how we answer questions. We don't answer with a fatwa from Islam Q&A. And then when the person say, where's the hadith? You stutter and stammer and don't know where it's at. Y'all see that? Y'all see that? Islam is based on just two sources, the Quran and the Sunnah. And if you can't back it up with a hadith, then you say you don't know. I'll go research it. Or you do like I do, get on that phone and call somebody that do know. But you don't sit there and answer questions about Islam with no fatwa. 
Then when the person call you out on that fatwa, you look stupid because you can't tell nobody the hadith. Okay. So what was the question again? I forgot. No, I just had to make that point. But what was her question again? The question was about having um can a person get a belly button oh, piercing? Oh, yeah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it is forbidden. It is forbidden. It is forbidden for a Muslim to mutilate himself. Islam forbids us from mutilating our bodies. Now, nose rings, earrings, things like that. The women and men have been wearing those for since, since Allah made Adam and Eve. But what purpose is there of piercing your stomach? What purpose is it there of piercing your nipples, your private parts, your buttocks? This is mutilation of the body. We have to understand that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, your body is an amina. It's a trust between you and Allah. And Allah is going to ask you how you cared for that trust, how you took care of your body. Your body is going to testify either for you or against you on the day of judgment. It's going to say, oh, Allah, it pierced me. She pierced me. She pierced my stomach and, 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 and uh, mutilated it, made it unattractive, made it not of any significance just to impress herself. So, no, we don't do our belly buttons. Your nose, your ears, yes, but that's it. Nose and ear, that's it. Many hadiths of companions with nose rings. Many hadiths of companions with earrings. But none of no bellies and all that. That's mutilation. Yeah. Is a nose ring too in regards to Muslim men? Can a Muslim man get... If it's part of your ring? culture, yes. And like I say, that's, been, that's cultural. That stuff's been going on for centuries. Egyptian men and Arabic men too. They, they, that's part of their culture. Okay. In regards to the cosmetic surgery, if a person knows is huge and they don't like it, can they get rhinoplasty done? Okay. Again, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that there, the law says that there's a cure for every sickness. What is the cure? For having a big nose. A big nose is, I mean, I, I mean, a treatment. There's a treatment and a cure for every sickness. Big nose. That's a, that's a sickness. A lot of people have a big nose. What is the treatment? Reduce it. So there's nothing wrong with that. I cannot tell y'all that things are haram. That's not. That's a treatment. If you have a big nose, then you get a nose reduction surgery. If you have big breasts, a lot of Muslim women's breasts are too big. We know that. Come on, women. Okay? Have the breast reduction surgery. Because if you don't have it done, it's going to cause other problems. It's going to cause your back to be, go out. Same with the nose. Your nose too big, it gets in the way. It gets in the way of eating. It gets in the way of, of kissing your husband. It gets in the way of, of smelling. So take the treatment. The treatment is nose reduction. Now, what we don't do is do it just for the fun of it or the vanity of it. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow because tomorrow we'll be doing the lawful and the unlawful. And we're going to talk about cosmetic surgery. Okay. Okay. So in regards back to that question about thanking a lot of brother Ahmad, um, he wants to know about thanking Allah. What if that person continue praying two rakats from thankfulness as much as he can? Tell him that, that he's a fanatic and he needs to stop it. What do you mean no, you praying? Person, to he said he said that person is also worried Allah will punish him and he feels he's not thanking Allah. This is a person that is about to self-destruct. This is a person that's about to commit suicide because this is a person that's losing hope. We have to have love, fear, and hope 
in equal proportions, balance. What did the prophets say happens if you have too much uh, fear and not enough hope? Too much fear leads to desperation. Too much fear leads to extremism. Too much fear leads to self-doubt. Too much fear leads to self-destruction. Too much fear leads to suicide. Now, do y'all see how people commit suicide? Tell this brother he needs to say, Audu, Balahi, Menashaitan, Mirajim, and stop it. And have hope of Allah's mercy. Allah says he forgives all sins, no matter how big they are, no matter how small they are. You have to believe that. Are you saying that Allah is a liar? You so worried that your puny little petty sins are too big for Allah? When Allah forgave a woman who was a prostitute, when Allah forgave a man who killed a hundred people, Allah forgave a man that cremated himself. You think that your sins are worse than theirs and he ain't going to forgive you? You better grow some hope, dude, because you are about to self-destruct. So you better say, Audu, Balahi, Menashaitan, Nirajim, and don't do no more thankful prayers for that instance. That's only when it happens. It's a one-time deal, Brother Merard. It's not every day. You do it when the good thing happens, and then you're done with it. The prophet said whenever you receive good news at that moment, that's when you do the prostrations of thankfulness. And then you get up and walk away, and you're done. He said spend the rest of your time helping others. So you feel that bad, go help your brothers and sisters. You got about 50 siblings, go help your brothers and sisters do their homework. Help your father take care of all them kids he got with his fine self. <laughs> the question was regarding Brother Ahmad. Oh, well, don't get me started on Murad because Papa's a rolling stone. Hello. Y'all don't want me to show Brother Marar's father's picture. He's a rolling stone with four wives and a hundred kids. <laughs> Brother Ammar, what's your problem? You better get over it, dude. Same advice to you. Stop it. Help your sister. Continue to help your father. Help your mother. Help your cousins. Help me on this website. You ain't been in the Zoom room. What's going on? We need you in here. It's drama every day. Check Sister Fresno. You, you need to check Fresno, Emma. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other question is, um, a sister wants to know, does donating to um, your website count as a pod, count as charity? Yes. Oh, my God. That's the best charity. You guys know when you guys donate to this website, you are getting the blessings, whatever blessings Allah gives me, whatever blessings Allah gives Sheikh Atli, whatever blessings Allah gives Jermali and any other person that speaks and Sheikh Morsi because he's my teacher, you're getting them too because we would not be able to do this if you were not paying for the service. You guys are paying to keep us on the internet. We're a tax-exempt organization. We're not rich. This is not affiliated with a mosque. This is a website that's run by old sick women, overseen by sick old women who don't even have husbands except for Fresno. That's why she can be all tough because she got a husband. So yes, you get this. This is charity. This is zakat. And look what you're doing. You're giving charity to the whole world. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said one of the best gifts of charity is knowledge, because everything that we're teaching from this website is based on Quran and Sunnah. This is the knowledge that's going to get you through life. This is the knowledge that's going to get you through the grave. Get you hopefully across that bridge. 
What better charity to give another Muslim than the gift of knowledge, the truth? The truth is a gift that can't be, uh, that a price cannot be put on. The truth is a gift that is so rare today, guys. Yeah, so yes, you know, this is our charity. Yes. Um, another question is, a brother wants to know, as a, a boy and a man, can you put designs in your head when someone is cutting your hair? No, because, well, for one thing, this is imitating the Kafir. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has forbidden us for imitating the Kafir. Number two, in Islam, you brothers, when y'all get haircuts, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said either cut it all off or make it all even. You cannot leave one part of your hair short, the other part long. You cannot shave one part of the hair and, and not shave the other. So no, those type of haircuts are haram for you brothers because they're imitation of the Kafir number one. And number two, the prophet said either let it grow or shave it off. You know, either cut it even. Uh, you know, you can't do like that. Those haircuts, a lot of you Muslim brothers wear is haram. And of course, dreadlocks are haram too. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said anyone who has hair should comb it, oil it, brush it, wash it on a regular basis. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw a man coming to the mosque and his hair was in dreads. They were all knotted up over his head. And he said, don't you have a, a comb? The man said, yes. The Prophet said, then go home and comb your hair. And the man did and he came back and the Prophet said, now isn't that better? instead of walking around looking like a jinn. The jinn wear their hair in dreadlocks, guys. And also the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, we're supposed to do the opposite of the jinn as well. We can't dress like the jinn, look like the jinn, emulate the jinn, okay? Yeah, a sister wants to know, I know a woman can't lead men in prayer, well, what if a group of women are praying together? Do they pray side by side or can another woman lead them? Okay, you can do either or. You can pray together with the sister leading in the middle or you can stand in the front and have the other sisters pray behind you. Either or. Okay. Another question a sister wants to know is, if you're traveling to another country for more than two weeks, how long can you combine or shorten your prayer? As long as you're there, as long as you're not settled. We have hadiths where some of the companions would combine their prayers. In fact, Kasaida Kudri did it for two years. You know, that uh, the combining the prayers is a concession from a law. You know, if you're not settled, you're living out of a suitcase, in other words, you're in a hotel. You're not in your home and you're not settled. You can combine as long as you're a traveler. So there's no time limit on that. And there's numerous hadiths where I show how the companions, the original companions would travel for different lengths of time and they combined and shortened, you know, during that whole time. Like I said, some for years. Okay. Yes. Um, Another person wants to know how does a person perform the obligatory prayers while they are while they are on the airplane for more than eight hours? You have to sit down because if you stand up and say Allahu Akbar, they're gonna shoot you and tackle you and throw you out the window, thinking that you 9/11 all over. So you pray sitting, facing whatever direction the plane is in. That's it, and don't you dare say Allahu Akbar out loud, or you gonna get tackled or tased and if i'm sitting there i might be the one to tackle you because i ain't going down either these terrorists are everywhere okay next question yes um a brother wants to know um what about having a mortgage living in the west it's kind of tough to pay 400k for a house then go move to the east <laughs> 
There is no such thing. And you cannot sit there and say, because it's hard. You know how much my rent is? I pay $1,300, $1,400 a month rent. So what? That's life. If, it, if the cost of living is too high, then move someplace where it's cheap. But no, you cannot use that as an excuse to go buy a mortgage because your mortgage is going to be high too. You know you stuck paying that for 30 something years? So there is, it's haram. You just pay your rent. Go find it. Lower your standards. Go find a cheaper apartment. Okay, but no, you cannot put, buy a house. That ain't no excuse. There's other alternatives. So no. A Muslim, yes. A Muslim sister wants to know if her hair isn't healthy and not growing properly, can she shave it all off? No. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Allah has cursed women that walk around looking like men. And the Prophet said uh, Islam forbids a woman to shave her hair completely. That's it. You can cut your hair. Even Aisha cut her hair to her ears, but you cannot shave your head off. That's looking like a man. Ain't no stud chicks here. Islam is all about, ain't about no uh, stud chick. It's manly. Be a woman. Own it. As Muslim women, we have to learn to own it. Okay. That's so far the questions I have on YouTube. Okay, this person named Neon. Did y'all get Neon? Yeah, we got him timed out. And then he timed out Brother Ahmad. I don't know how he did it. Block him. Y'all see how you, I just clicked on it now. I just didn't know. Y'all see that word block user on YouTube? Since he's one of them Christians, he don't need to be here ever. Block him. I mean, if, if, if y'all look at these people and they're Christians, just block them. They ain't got this. Ain't no Christian. I already website. blocked them. Yeah, there you go. They ain't no Christian. I mean, this ain't no Christian website. They're not welcome here. I'm not in their channel. Why they in here? Goodbye. Just block them. Yeah. Yeah. Subhanallah. Yeah. So, mashallah. You know, guys. I hope y'all see that this religion is simple. This religion is easy. It's not as hard as people make it out to be. But I want to address one issue before we close tonight, because I said I would, and the person's waiting for me to do it. Balance. As you guys see, with most of the answers I gave to the questions here, it entailed reminding each other that we are people of balance. Balance. This is what we have a problem with. Balance when it comes to doing your good deeds. You don't want to burn yourself out. You don't want to overdo it. Have balance. Be balanced in your love. Be balanced in your hate. Be balanced. And one of the things I need to address with you brothers and you sisters is gammy. It's called gammy. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Polygamy. For you sisters out there, you have to understand that this is a right that Allah gave to every man. That's his right. Just like you got your rights, the right to be provided for, the right to be maintained, the right to be treated like a queen, because women don't have to work in Islam. That's not our job. Women are not providers and maintainers in Islam. We're supposed to be at home, safe, sound with the children. We don't work. We don't have to. That's not an obligation for us. And I don't know why you sisters settle for, the, for, for less than that. But that's your choice. But just like it's your right to be pampered and be a queen, it's his right to have four queens. He ain't got to have just one. Okay, as long as he is doing what Allah tells him to do, which is be just, 
And that's what we're going to talk about here. Balance, just, and how he spends his time with you. That's what that's talking about. Just does not mean because he bought her a new car because she needed one. You want a new car too. Oh, no, no. Just means in his time. If he's going to spend three nights with you, he has to spend three nights with everyone else. The time, the time meaning nights. Y'all get that, sisters? I'm going to break it down to you in plain English, what the Arabs don't break down. Just refers to nights. What does that mean? That, mean, that means during the daytime, he can go visit whoever the heck he wants to. I'm just keeping it real, sisters. I know the Hadith and I know English. So I'm going to explain it to you like the men can't who speak all that Arabic. He ain't got to be what he do during the daytime is his business. If he wants to go see that wife over there and take and eat and, and eat and, and have breakfast with her, like the prophet would do with Zainab, which is why Aisha would get jealous, just applies to the nights he spend with you, not who he's with during the day. This is your night, Aisha, the prophet would remind her. It's your night. But in the daytime, the day is mine. My night belongs to you, but my time during the day belongs to whatever. It's mine. So if I want to eat honey with Zainab, I can. If I want to go for a walk with Sauda, I can. If I want to go and talk to Um Salama about a, something that's going on, I can. You can't stop me from visiting with my other wives. These are authentic hadiths I'm quoting y'all. Understand that just when Allah says be just with your wives, he is speaking about the time he spends with y'all in nights, not what he does. He can go visit whoever he want to. That's the reality. As long as he got his behind at home with you at night, that's all that matters. Do you sisters understand that? And on the other level, you brothers, it's your turn now. Y'all better get it together. Allah says in the Quran, if you can't be just, if you can't be just and fair with your nights with them, then just marry one. Who you think you are? You ain't God's gift. Ain't nothing gold that I know of. Hello? You got to give them women their rights. If it's this sister's night, then you go to her house. You can't say you mad at her. So you gonna <clears throat> ghost her and not go spend the night with her. You gonna go to another woman's house instead. That's not a slime. Learn from the prophet. He went through a lot with his wives. His wives used to fight each other. They used to argue. They got into fist fights. Did y'all know that? Oh, yeah. Sometimes the prophet's wives got into some fist fights. Hafsa, she had a heavy hand like her daddy. And Aisha had that mouth. OK. But the prophet was just with his knights. He didn't renege on that. If you can't be like him with those knights, then you need to just have one. Then maybe your other wives need to just divorce your behind. Go find a man that do understand that this is my night and not hers. And you have to check a woman because women play games. I've been there, done it. Here it is, one sister, Sister Amatula's night. You there with her? She can't even enjoy you because the phone keeps ringing. The uh, uh, Sister D keeps calling. Oh, the baby's sick. You better check Sister D and tell her, look, them shaitanic games, the baby wasn't sick when I left there this morning. I'm sorry. This is Amatula's time. 
You deal with the baby. Call your mother. Call your father. Call Judge Judy. But this is not your night. You brothers, y'all want to do gammy. You better do it like the prophet did. The prophet had to check his wives with that. Mainly my favorite, Aisha. The gangs women play. Remember, if there were any creature that was able to outsmart Shaitan, it would have been a woman. Take it from a woman. Women play games. Oh, the baby's sick. Oh, you got to come home. Oh, I can't do this. I'm about to die. I got COVID. Oh, you brothers better man up and learn how to check those women and say, you better call somebody else. Call your daddy. Call your brother. This ain't your time. And you sisters that want to play those games, you better stop crying wolf because I've seen it happen. One day you're going to cry wolf and it's not really wolf and the person ain't going to respond and you stuck there with a bullet hole through your window. I've seen that happen. You know, Gammy, you know, it's a good thing. But it takes adults to do gammy. All right. It takes a mature breed of, of a, a breed of a man. And a wise breed of a man. It takes a strong, mature woman to do gammy. All that teenage game crap that you brothers are doing and you sisters are playing. Y'all need to throw that out to the side, man. Life is too short. It ain't about that. Life is too short. We got to take life serious. Death can come at any moment knocking on anyone's door. Don't blame Allah. Allah didn't make anything uh, 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 lawful that's bad and dirty. Polygamy is not bad and dirty. It's good. It's just that you got a corrupt brain. You got a corrupt a dive blame yourself. And if you don't like it, you don't have to even do it as a woman. You can get out of it. Just say, excuse me, Kula, I can't handle it. Like the prophet's daughter Fatima did. There ain't no way I can deal with that. You know, he want to marry Abu Lahab's daughter. You know, forget that. Let me tell y'all the truth by Abu Lahab's daughter. Y'all know she was fine. They was all the same family. She was beautiful like Zainab. Zainab, Abu Lahab's daughter, the prophet Muhammad, they were all cousins. They were beautiful. Aisha was jealous as heck of her. It wasn't just the fact that she was his daughter. She was fine, beautiful woman. Do you understand? Long hair and big dark eyes and dark eyebrows. Plus she come from nobility. Her father was richer than Abu Bakr was. So it was a jealousy thing there, okay? And then with Fatima, the daughter of the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with her, that's her cousin. That was her cousin. That was her cousin. She was beautiful. You sisters got to stop playing those games. Fatima went to her father and told her, I cannot be married. Uh, and be a co-wife to the daughter of Abu Lahab. She said, I love Ali. I love him. I couldn't handle that. It hurts me. And she was crying. It hurts me. I, I, I can't share him. It hurts me crying. So the prophet said, don't worry. I'll take care of this. He went to Ali. He said, oh, Ali, don't you know that I love my daughter, yes. And whatever hurts her, hurts me, yes. My daughter's crying her heart out. He said, it would hurt her that you take on another wife. And worse than that, the wife you taking on is the daughter of Abu Jahl. She fine, she related, you know, good stock, we good family, nobility. But it hurts Fatima. 
And what hurts her hurts me. So Ali didn't marry the woman. In fact, he never took on a second wife at all as long as he was married to Fatima because it hurt her. So if you sisters can't handle it, then just get out of it. Just go and say, look, you know, this is a matter, it's compromising my deen, my practice, because as Muslim women and men, we don't do anything that's going to compromise our deen. You just tell the brother, I love you, but I don't love you more than I do Allah or myself. So I got to get out of this relationship and just get a divorce. If you don't want to be a part of it, get a divorce, get a cooler, get out of that. But don't sit there blaming Allah, saying that Allah is bad. Allah did something bad because you can't handle this situation or the brother ain't balanced. He's not doing it right with the balance. And you brothers, if you can't balance, you shouldn't be taking on second, third, fourth wives. Balance. And that's all I got to say about that. Any other questions on that? And I hope I answered your question, sister. Did I answer your question? All right. Okay. Well, alhamdulillah, I think we come to the end of tonight's um, Q&A session. Uh, tomorrow is Saturday. I want to remind all the uh, people listening to me that don't forget you have Dr. Assam's class tomorrow. Dr. Assam does the uh, reflections of the Quran. And what does he want y'all to work on, Fatima? What? What? Oh, cool, who Allah, who who? <laughs> nope, solid. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, y'all, everybody review uh, the meaning of it. And then what he wants you to do is to speak about how that meaning is implied in your life, how you incorporate the meaning uh, of that of that sewer into your life. Okay, that's what Dr. Asim's class said too. And also don't forget tomorrow at nine is my class on the lawful and unlawful. I'm going to be continuing. We're going to talk about cosmetic surgery. What does it mean to go to the extremes? That's the question. What is considered the extremes in beautification? That's at nine. We also have our six o'clock class on the prayer tomorrow. We're going to talk about the um, uh, some more about the voluntary prayers. And inshallah, you guys have Sheikh Atley at um, four o'clock. Hopefully, if these women ain't ran them out of here, I don't know. Might be ran out. Ain't Layla's fault. That was all Fresno. Own it, Fresno. It wasn't Layla, not she. But y'all know Fred. Who is she? Where that picture at? This who did it, y'all. There she is. Motorcycle Hell's Angel. 80-year-old Fresno. Let's hope she ain't ran him out of here. But inshallah, his class will be at 4 o'clock tomorrow, the beginner's Arabic, and then he has his 7 o'clock Hadith class, inshallah. All right, any questions before we end up? And please support this Dawah effort, guys. We're desperately, desperately in need of donations to pay for this, uh, the software that I'm using and all this stuff. Please click on, uh, scan that uh, QR link with your um, uh, phone and support us, inshallah. Any questions or comments? Okay, well, I'm going to close out here uh, for tonight. Uh, I think this was a good session. Uh, the inshallah, I'll see everybody tomorrow. Supana kala huma wa bihamdika. A shadow on laila haila anta. A stock wa tubu lake. And Allah knows best.